Okay, good morning and welcome to uh, another episode of Crime Pays But Biden It Doesn't. I'm coming to you from East Texas, uh, from uh, Jasper County, Texas, at an elevation of about 300 feet. We're on a Catahoula Formation here. You can see you got the nice sandy soil and whatnot. The Catahoula Formation is about, I don't know, I think I, think I read like 300, 300 feet thick. And then beneath that, you got some clay. And uh, why I'm mentioning that is because you get the, the clay that kind of, you know, acts as a, a, a bottom that holds the water and the water pulls up you know and of course it's porous on the sandstone and uh and ends up running out running into a little seep uh down down the way i'll show you down there we got a nice bog down there with some pitcher plants and what the shit but the ecosystem i wanted to show you now is uh pretty rare in north america these days though you know three four hundred years ago it was relatively common this is the long leaf pine ecosystem and uh of course uh, the basis of it is the long leaf pine pinus palustris you could see right here with the a pretty notable uh, juvenile stage, just looking like uh, looking like a uh, little little rads, <clears throat> okay, little rods poking up above the grass. Okay, it's got a very interesting ecology, uh, including the fact that when they're young, they get this uh, this grass stage right here. Kind of just looks like a bunch grass, but that's actually a pine. You can see the needles, needles in fascicle of three. You can see the uh, the little sheath around the. The three needles right down there. Now they'll stay in this stage for upwards of uh, 10 years sometimes. Just, you know, photosynthesizing, building that energy, putting it into that uh, root system. And once they get enough energy, then they just shoot up. And you can see, I mean, they literally just shoot up. No lateral branching at all, just straight vertical. Kind of kind of a goofy form there. I, I love this. I love this tree. I grew one in Oakland. It didn't do too well. I mean, it's, it didn't do bad. It's just, you know, still looks like that six years later. I actually bought the seedlings in a parking lot of a uh, wind dixie in mississippi like five or six years ago it looked like some sketchy drug deal but this guy just came out and you know uh, sold me a bunch of trees in a bag <clears throat> and he was a big advocate of this uh this tree a lot of people around here you know at least the conservation minded folks really uh really go nuts over this tree and rightfully so you could see uh i mean look at that oh you got some branching right there anyway uh, needless to say, like many pines, this is a fire-dependent pine. You need fire, uh, basically to clear away all the competition. And, uh, you know, fire was, a, a, like many ecosystems in North America, an integral part of this ecosystem, uh, for years, <clears throat> for centuries. Until, uh, of course, you know, we had the whole Smoky Bear is an asshole thing, you know, you know fire repression, uh, etc. So fire suppression, I guess, either one, whatever the fuck. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh... Anyway, we're going to explore, we're going to explore, we're going to see what's going on. We're going to uh, take a cast of some of the species here. This is really healthy. You can see right here, further down away, uh, you know, you get an understory of a lot of sweet gums, a lot of liquid ambar, which is a native, but, uh, you know, they, they kind of overtake. They occur in a density, which they uh, probably didn't, uh, you know, three, four hundred years ago, uh, you know, when uh, native peoples, as well as lightning, uh, we're lighting fires to uh, manage this ecosystem. So anyway, there you go, Pinus pollutris. You can see they get the, they get very tall right there, very tall. No branching up at the top. They create this nice dappled, uh, dappled light, this kind of bright, ca bright canopy, and uh, just a really, a really great tree. We're at the western edge of this species range right here. They go east towards Florida, up into Georgia, etc. So, uh, but they always occur uh, on these kind of sandy soils. So. Uh, Look at the way he pees over there, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going to try that next time. Does that work for you, Jack? Okay, let's keep moving. Looks like uh, looks like a rat snake uh, took his clothes off right here. Pantherophis. Oh, shit. It's broken. Anyway, got your uh, good old uh, Ilexa vomitoria, which is everywhere. Kind of with a branching structure reminiscent of a buckthorn. Or some sort of ramnacea, but uh, it's actually you know r uh, closely related to a uh, uh, yerba mate. So there's caffeine in those leaves. You can make a little tea out of them, you know. Crush them up, get wired. It was called vomitoria, uh, kind of a misnomer. I think if you drink a bunch of it, you might puke. But I mean, otherwise, it's just you know. But a lot of plants have caffeine in them. Okay, so it's not too notable. Caffeine is just a common alkaloid, which uh, is meant to discourage uh, herbivory. But, uh, you know, it's, at this point, I'm uh, so thoroughly addicted to it, I'm kind of fucked. Look at that. Look at it. You got a lovely uh, picture right there. The sun coming through of a nice canopy of uh, Pinus palustris. 
just, you know, tall telephone poles, you know, and you could obviously get a tree that's straight, good lumber tree, it, thing's gonna get fucking robbed, you know, it's, it's gonna, it got looted early on, these forests got looted early on, uh, you know, there's not, there's not a whole lot of them left, but there's been a bit, you know, like I said, people love them, so there's been a lot of restoration uh, happening, but uh, just a, a fucking great tree, I mean, really, you know, I think they're planting these out in a, planting them out in cultivation more as well. Okay, here we go. New poison oak species for me. New uh, Toxicodendron. This is Toxicodendron pubescens. You know, some people can handle this without any reaction. Some people will get cocky. They handle it a couple times with no reaction, and then they end up having one, you know, on their ninth or tenth exposure. Uh, me, personally, I react to Urushi, all the compound, and all the Toxicodendron species, and we'll see Toxicodendron vernix, the poison sumac, down the way. Uh, I react to it pretty bad. You know, sometimes I feel like all I got to do is get within a couple inches of it. I was living in Austin once, you know, 16 years ago, the dogs were running through it. It was in uh, the dormant stage, didn't have any leaves on it. Just those, uh, just a bunch of little shoots poking out, out the ground. The dogs were running through it. I was wrestling with the dogs. You know, two days later, I had what amounted to a, a breast hanging off my rib cage, just swollen with pus and uh, white blood cells and all other kinds of, uh, you know, autoimmune uh, fluids. Just, uh, and I, I went to the doctor, but, you know, healthcare in this country is so bad at the, uh, I waited there four or five hours, so nothing happened. I just went home and uh, took a couple antihistamines, and it got better. But, uh, so, you know, some people react to it pretty bad. Toxicodendron is a large genus. You get them in Japan. You get them in South America. They're uh, basically all over the world. And, uh, you know, closely allied to the true sumex in the genus Rus. But uh, Rus doesn't produce Eurasia. And the fruits look a little bit different. So there you go. Toxicodendron pubescens. Up here, and you know, keep in mind we're in the uplands now. We're going to be going down into the bog, so there's going to be plants here you're not going to see down in the baggy bog. This is more of a just a acidic, sandy uh, upland site, and it's got uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful plants like this. Uh, this is called the uh, hoary pea. Okay, the, the maybe it's Texas hoary pea. I don't know, whatever. Tephrosia is the genus. Okay, and look at it. Look at how uh, look at all the hairs on these this pinnate foliage right here. It's got one single flower left. Okay. Nice stunner too. Look at how look at how large that uh, that uh, dorsal petal is. That uh, banner. You got the so remember with peas you got the banner wings and keel. Banners the dorsal petal in the back. They're normally not as big as this though. Almost looks uh, vaginal. Okay. Almost looks obscene. You got the wings on either side and then the bottom uh, petal is that keel petal, which is just the two fused petals. So uh, this is a pretty you know this is a stunner right here. Oh my God, it's obscene. Oh, Georgia O'Keeffe couldn't have done it justice. Look at that. Maybe she could have done it. I don't know, whatever. Tephrosia, so Tephrosia is a genus. It's got about 30 species in it, mostly Eastern North American. These flowers start off white and they mature to red again. It's too bad there's not more of them on there. There's only just this one left, kind of late in the season here. The question I want to know, though, is uh, am I going to get an ass rash since this flower was brushing up against the Tarsicodendron? Maybe, all in the name of botany. And you get, of course, in that keel, you got those 10 stamens. Look at the calyxes. This is, this is a fucking great plant. I wish, you know, hopefully this is in cultivation. No one's growing these native plants, okay? At least not out east, it seems. There's not a lot of native plant. The native plant things mostly, is, at least as far as I could tell, out west. It's catching on, but, uh, you know, you still get people just planting all this tacky, heinous shit in front of their houses when the native flora around them is fucking incredible. You know, you got, you're sitting on like a wealth of of diversity that's perfectly adapted, low maintenance to your area, but people choose to plant crepe myrtles and boxwoods and other tacky shit. Kills me. Okay, this guy's a stunner. He's not he's not blooming. Okay, you're just gonna have to look up look up pictures of the flowers on the internet or something, because they are they're fucking bangers, okay? This is Erythrina herbacea. Alright, look at a typical of herbaceous bastard, got the the three leaflets, okay? The flowers are incredible though. They're elongated, tubular you know, obviously, uh, in red, obviously pollinated by hummingbirds. And then, of course, so you got these seeds, uh, quite likely bird dispersed, but they're toxic uh, to mammals. You know, they're, uh, they've been used as rat poison, etc. You get this guy, you know, from Florida. It's the only species of erythrina uh, in the southeast. You get it uh, going, you know, from the Caribbean, Florida, and down on into Mexico. Of course, you get a couple more uh, erythrinas, the coral beans uh, in the American southwest, too. All, uh, I mean, the whole genus is just fucking you know pretty uh pretty fantastic okay what you would call fan fucking tastic look at the uh ow jesus christ 
speaking of which, look at the uh, recurved spines right there, just uh, below. Yeah, I guess those would be uh, they're technically stipules, probably. Just right belief, right, right beneath the uh, the petiole. Okay, glabrous leaves, kind of forms a little clump. Okay, probably can come back uh, no problem after a fire. There's some fresher foliage. <clears throat> Might take some of these, try to grow them. You know, probably do well uh, in South Texas. You know. Anyway, there you go, Erythrina herbacea. Okay, and like I said, you just gotta look the flowers up. This is this this thing needs to be planted out more in cultivation too. Here we go, a native grape, Vitus rotundifolia. It, you know, it can kind of tend to take over. Look at a glabrous, uh, have axial surface, super uh, waxy smooth. Okay, here we go. Who doesn't like liatris? We got some straight liatris porn, probably one of the most showy members of the uh, the whole goddamn genus. Okay, Asteraceae, of course, Eupatoriae's the tribe. Uh, this is liatris elegans, and what looks like uh, petals right there, those are actually phyleries. That's what makes this species so notable. Those are the phyleries. Okay, the, the actual corollas, the florets uh, corollas have fallen off. These are kind of late stage. You can see they're still here on that guy. See, they're, they're white. Oh yeah, over there too. You can see the styles. The, the Eupatoriae-ish styles poking out right there but uh really the phyleries here are just the uh, they're goddamn stunners okay and it's just these are diminutive ones all right i just i didn't see any taller they'd only get a lot taller otherwise i'd be showing you those over here we got the uh, wonderful plant plant uh, be sure to put that in your mouth this is a uh, nidoscolis the texas nidoscolis euphorbiaceae is the family uh you know this is a genus down in mexico they get about four or five feet tall of course, I had a friend, I always like to tell this story, uh, he was looking for, uh, he's a mycologist, he was doing mushroom work down there, and uh, touched one of them, he slipped on a slope, grabbed one with his hand, uh, got all those, and then slid, so he got all those fucking stinging hairs in his hand, uh, started to go into anaphylactic shock, and I uh, went to a clinic, and because, uh, you know, the American healthcare system is so broken. What would have cost him nine hundred dollars to get, you know, the EpiPen shot only cost him five bucks in Mexico, and he was fine. Okay, just a just a five dollar mistake right there. Here it would have cost you, you know, nine hundred to eleven hundred dollars, probably with insurance. What a fucking mess. Yeah, you know, sorry, I always got to take a take a minute to shit on the health healthcare system here because it's so fucking broken, especially the uh, the health insurance companies. I ever get diagnosed with a terminal illness? Okay. There's, I'm going to go, well, let's not get into it, okay? But I was, <laughs> could get me in trouble. But uh, I'll keep it lighthearted. Anyway, uh, there you go. There's a Nidoscolis. I do love this plant. Euphorbiaceae is the family. You can see just covered in stinging hairs all over the leaves. Holy shit. And, uh, oh, that's nice. Looks like I'm sitting on some Toxicodendron. I've, I've just got to accept the fact I'm, I'm going to break out of an ass rash. There's no no getting over it. Anyway, there you go. Liatris elegans. Diminutive uh, individual right here. They get a lot taller. But a wonderful fucking species. There you go. Okay, real quick. Just following up with that Liatris. You can see there's the seed right there. The individual Akeen. Technically a Cipsula. You got the Pappus on top of it. And there you can see clear illustration that those... Uh, those what look like petals, those showy bracts, are actually just the phyleries. Okay, so distinct in this damn species. God damn, I love. It. I meant to collect some of this. Okay, uh, we didn't make it too far. Here we are, crouched down in the uh, Toxicodendron pubescens again. Just want to make extra sure that I'm miserable uh, in a few days. <laughs> it's just the masochist in me, the Chicago enemy. Anyway, uh, here we go. Here's another uh, fabacious bastard. Uh, this genus has about 25 species in it. You, you get it, uh, it's mostly, you know, you get it in Mexico, but uh, in the United States, it's mostly in the southeast. This is Rincosia latifolia. The prairie snout bean. You got your trifoliate leaves, probably Faboidea subfamily. I mean, not probably, I know it is, but anytime you see those trifoliate leaves, you can go ahead and assume, uh, if it's in the Fabaceae, it's in the Faboidea subfamily, the Papillon, whatever the fuck, means butterfly in French. I'll just call it for boy stuff. And then, of course, you got the legume fruits. Look at the calyx still on there. Those brown, that brown calyx. And a little, it looks like a little bean. A little bean pod. Pubescent stems. Pubescent leaves. And a yellow flowers when it's going off. Okay? You can, you can uh, you know, enjoy the shit out of flowers, out of plants, even if they're not flowering. You just pay attention to vegetative aspects of it. It's still, still really interesting. I mean, you know, 
I don't just like flowers because they because they're fun to. I don't like just just like plants because they put out flowers that are nice to look at and calming and soothing and all that shit. You know, just like the fucking the classical music in the dialysis clinic. Okay, I like plants because I like the evolution, the ecology. I like paying attention how they interact, etc. Just the uh, you know. And now if you got a smartphone or some shit, you can read about this shit. You know, find a plant you like, go read about it in the fucking uh, you know, just crush down the bush, whatever. Yeah, go to a botanic garden, do the same thing. You know, it's, lead yourself on your own botany tours. Another showy bastard of those uh, sandy, acidic, uh, longleaf pine uplands right here. We got the Pycnanthemum albescens. Okay, member of the mint family, Lamiaceae. And this is actually in the tribe of mints, the Menthiae tribe of Lamiaceae. Same uh, tribe that the oregano and thyme and, and all that uh, shit you would use in cooking is in, especially the oregano. Okay, inflorescence is a verticillaster, a bunch of little flowers whirled around uh, the central axis of the stem. But notable about this species is those top two leaves kind of act as petals. They kind of act as floral attractants. Okay, see down here, just regular green. Up here, they uh, they flush white. Okay, uh, poinsettia does the same thing. In no way related to this, just another, uh, <clears throat> you know, another trait that helps the plant uh, basically attract pollinators to those flowers. Poinsettia, of course, is in Euphorbiaceae. This is in the mint family, Lamiaceae. Look at those uh, individual flowers. It's a tiny one. Only one or two one or two flowers still going off. Got speckling on that corolla. Zygomorphic corolla, bilaterally symmetrical, as opposed to actinomorphic, radially symmetrical. But those flowers are something else. Oh, it smells kind of good, too. Look at all those uh, those little resin glands on that leaf right there. Anyway, there you go. Pycnanthemum albescens. Oh, yeah. I class, you don't even gotta bust out the grill over there. You know, you got some garlic, you got some Valentina. Okay, I need about a 40 ounce bottle of that. Just a little food break. Okay, so we've kind of dropped down a little bit uh, from the upland site. You can see we got this liquid ambar, the sweet gum everywhere here, just kind of forming a little thicket. Okay, you probably know this guy, common in horticulture, common street tree in a in a urban and suburban settings, the seed pods look like a little spiky ball. Okay, liquid ambar styrasa flu. I've seen this in the uh, forest of the Chiapas cloud forest down in southern Mexico at elevations of about 7,000 feet. You know, just kind of blending in with the pines and oaks there. Here, uh, you know, it's forming kind of a dominant uh, component of the forest. You got this thick understory because since we've dropped down elevation, these trees are tapping into the groundwater. They're closer into the groundwater. I do want to show you this plant over here. This uh, little fuzzy bastard, this fuzzy bean. Okay, remember the sexy pink beans. This is Strophostyles umbellata in the Phaseolia tribe of the legume family Fabaceae. Okay, look, it's got those uh, it, those contorted wing petals, that the twisted and inverted keel petal with the purple up, up there at the top, and then of course the banner petal is just uh, just massive. And then of course there's a little legume on an old flower right there. Look at this flower that hasn't even come out yet. Okay, quite a stunner too. It's a uh, white. The outer outer parts of the petals are white right there. And I, the calyx, you can see the cal little green calyx at the base. Now, Phaseolia is the uh, tribe of the legume family that uh, many of the legumes uh, that humans consume are in. <clears throat> many of the beans, the black beans, the high-fiber diets, whatever. Okay, I'm a big fan of black beans. As uh, anyone who I've gassed out in the cab of a locomotive might know. Uh, okay. Really, I've really subjected people to some, some damage there. Uh, anyway, uh, Strophostyles... Uh, you got uh, you got the three species in the genus, and uh, but the, you know the whole the whole tribe Phaseolia is a uh, pretty cool. You get a you get a Phaseolus species. You get they're common in uh, quite common in North America, especially when you get to the lower latitudes. I've seen a bunch in the in Mexico and quite a few uh, here in the southeast. Okay, and just a couple feet lower here, you can see we're starting to get our first uh, carnivorous plants. This is Drosera capillaris. You see, it's got a little flower spike coming up. Just covered in those uh, those uh, trichomes, those glandular trichomes that the stick insects, making for a uh, ready source of nitrogen in a relatively uh, nitrogen-poor uh, soil. They're, they're everywhere, too. They don't get too big. Maybe the size of a of a quarter or a half dollar at most, but but they're driving here. Oh, yeah, nice money shot of that dresser. This is a large one. You can see it's about... I don't know, five, uh, five centimeters across. Just starting to send up a little uh, inflorescence right there. Over here, we got a plant known as uh, the yellow-eyed grass in the genus Xeris. 
which is actually a genus I saw when I was in New Caledonia. Zeridaceae is the family. It's a monocot, of course. Quite beautiful in the leaves. And then uh, it sends up a tall, you can see it tends up, sends up a tall spike right here with a yellow flower up top. And uh, the flower looks like shit right now, but when it's open, it's got tree petals. And look at all the bracts on the, uh, the flower head right there. Oh, yeah, and it's not a bog unless you got a lycopod. Species of Lycopodiella. Okay, one of the uh, a line, one of the earlier lineages of uh, land plants, of vascular land plants. Just kind of growing prostrate around along the ground right there. You can see all the xeris coming up right there. There's a little seedling. We've got the droseras. Oh shit! There, there you go. Massive patch of drosera, and over here we got a species of burmania which is in a very odd family. It doesn't look like much right now. Tiny white flowers, but it's a mycoheterotroph, okay? A partial mycoheterotroph. So it can photosynthesize on its own, but it's also uh, stealing a little bit of energy from fungi. We'll see a species that down away that's uh, achlorophilus, doesn't have any chlorophyll, doesn't photosynthesize, and steals all of its energy from fungus. It lives in the understory of the woodland. I'm about to show you. There you go. And I got some nice sphagnum moss too. And of course... We got our pitcher plants, the uh, Saracenia alata. So there you go, Saracenia alata, okay? Three uh, three genera in the family, Saraceniaceae. You got Darlingtonia out west, Saracenia, which is mostly in the east and also at the higher latitudes. Uh, you got Purpurea at the higher latitudes, you know, kind of a boreal uh, species. And then you got the, the genus Heliamphora uh, down there in uh, at the Puis of uh, northern South America. <clears throat> And some of these you could see. Let's see if there's a guy in there right now. Some of these, oh yeah. So there's a guy in there right now, but he's uh, he's not going to be consumed. He's actually a pitcher plant moth. So this is his host plant, okay, or she. She'll name it. She'll uh, lay her eggs in there, and uh, the larva will consume the the foliage as they grow, and then uh, and they have no they have no trouble getting out. You know, but most insects do. You could see. Well, if you had a microscope, you could see a bunch of. You can almost see. Oh shit! I just ripped it. You can see a bunch of tiny little hairs, you know, which of course work to keep the guys in there, keep the bugs down in there from crawling out, you know, where they'll be consumed by uh, bacterial enzymes, which will aid in uh, nitrogen, uh, nitrogen absorbs <coughs> absorption for the plant. Okay, because these, again, these soils, these sandy, baggy soils uh, just don't have much uh, accessible nitrogen. Beautiful color on it, though. I think uh, purpurea. Saracenia purpurea is probably my favorite, at least. And over here you got some uh, another carnivorous plant. Not in any way related to uh, that Saracenia I just showed you. Just convergent evolution. Okay, similar responses to uh, similar conditions. But uh, you got a species of Utricularia. Right there, the bladder warts. And that flower is really something else. And it's uh, Utricularia. So Lentibularyaceae is the family... That bilateral symmetry would indicate that it's probably in Lamiales, the order of mints, which it is. Okay, a lot of, uh, I think they're mostly, well, not all of them, but they're mostly in that order, mostly bilaterally symmetrical, zygomorphic, <coughs> zygomorphic flowers. Now, looking at this, you might be wondering, where the hell is the meal going on? I pulled this guy up, I'm a dick, but I'm going to put him back, don't worry. The meal is going on right down there. Okay, if you could see those little bladder-filled uh, appendages to the roots. Okay, he's mostly uh, for nitrogen. He's uh, eating little protozoans. He's having a protozoan lunch. Okay, little uh, protozoans, microorganisms, etc. Maybe some amoebas down there. You can see they're just uh, just driving. But he's also, you know, he's got green in there, so he's photosynthesizing well. No, no true leaves. Maybe a little bit. Maybe a little. No, nah, that's just another flower shoot coming up. Anyway, let's put this guy back. Okay, sorry about that. Don't hate me. Shit, look at that guy. One of those massive water spiders. How did he do that? How does he do that? How does he do that? Massive old bastard. Oh. Oh, he's, look, he's getting sensual with me. Do you like that? Do you like the caress? Do you like the gentle caress? Oh, that's nice. I like an arachnid who's not afraid to feel. Don't be afraid of love. Have you ever have you ever had an embrace like this before? 
How'd you get so fuzzy? What are you doing? What are you, who are you waiting for? Are you waiting on bugs? Are you going to eat a tadpole or something? Do you mind me asking you all these questions? Look, it's a bag mushroom. Little guy coming up in a sphagnum right there. Tiny little fucker. Bright red. And, and then above it all, you got one of the wax myrtles. Morella, form formerly Mirica Carolinians. Got kind of a convex texture on that leaf, kind of curved upward. Abaxial surface is a... Uh, yeah, what's it like? It's kind of kind of glabrous, kind of got a weird texture to it, honestly. But on the uh, the stem, pubescent, you got a few hairs on there, see that? Axial buds above the leaf petiole. Got two species in this genus, uh, formerly Mirica namorella, uh, down here in the southeast. There's the Bermania again, with those tiny, tiny flowers. And there's the uh, the basal, basal leaves. Look at this, uh, this, uh, leaf this pitcher plant leaf before it uh, fully uh, matures and opens up into a pitcher Ooh, nice texture so smooth another uh, Ludwigia right here kind of the, the wetland version of an evening primrose of an onagrade onagraceae you know this one's got four petals seen one yesterday it only had five inferior ovary you can see that right there look at it look at a calyx almost kind of looks like a mimulus calyx very keeled. Okay, kind of the off season for a flower right here, but uh, you can see this one was just barely holding on, dangling. It looks like a moth got it, so I ripped it off so I could show you. But uh, off season for uh, for the flower here, and it's a Saracenia a lot of it. You can see you got the ovary right there. You got the sepals up top, uh, the petals, the uh, all those anthers filled with pollen on that central ovary, which will mature. And, uh, and then dehiss and contains dozens of seeds, you know, upon successful pollination. And then you got this large umbrella shaped thing, which is the style. Okay. This whole, this whole umbrella is the style. And then you got the little, uh, downward pointing beaked stigma right there. So, uh, what's interesting about Saracenia flowers is they've got a very successful, uh, method, uh, morphologically of avoiding self pollination. To get inside and get that, uh, collect all that pollen, a bee will have to crawl in through the flap. See these petals, these dangling petals pre prevent them from just going in that way. He's got to crawl up, crawl in up top there, hopefully come into contact with that downward pointing beak, that stigma, which is, you know, collects, which is receptive to pollen and, you know, upon a pollen grain that get, getting deposited on that, you get successful pollination. And then he's got to crawl in there, he'll do a little dance, dance around, collect the pollen and what the shit. And, uh, and then to get out, uh, he just, uh, comes through, just, you know, comes under this little petal, uh, this little flap-like petal right there, and flies off onto another flower. Okay, thus avoiding coming into contact again with that uh, that beak-shaped stigma and uh, avoiding uh, self-pollination. So, and then he'll fly off, to, you know, to another flower and do the same thing. Crawl it, crawl in through the top up there, come into contact with that stigma, drop some pollen off on it, pollinate the flower, and then uh, and then collect the pollen and come out through that, uh, that bottom flap. So it seems to work for it, all right? Pretty ingenious, if you ask me. Look at this little guy right there. It's Arachnid Monday, apparently. I didn't know. No one let me know. Beautiful little uh, orb spider right there. Oh, fucking pattern on the back right there. Anyway, so, yeah, that's that's how that's how it works. So you get successful regeneration. Each one of those ovaries will contain dozens of seeds, and you'll get, uh, hopefully, dozens of plants coming up, like you got going on here in this uh, baggy lowland of a... Uh, uh, longleaf pine woodland. Oh yeah, there we go. Another ass rash plant right there. Toxicodendron vernix, the poison sumac. But again, not a true sumac because true sumacs aren't a genus Roos. Look at that. There's a tall one right there. Holy shit. This guy likes wetland areas. All right, I can already feel uh, my skin boiling. Okay, but if you get the rash, you gotta go. You gotta at least just once. You know, I mean, you you know, put the nice. Uh, Remedial uh, applications on it, but just once you got to go stand in the shower and eat the hot water. Feels fucking great. Okay. Oh, look at the top of the leaves right there. Dark green. And uh, just uh, covered in urushiol. Glabrous stems. And the leaf shape looks a lot different from, uh, you know, similar looking species than a genus Roos. What a miserable bastard. Too bad we don't have any flowers or fruits I could show you those. Okay, so we're going to crawl into the bush right here to see what we got going on. In this uh, 
thick understory. Here we go, there's a just common American holly, Ilex opaca. Those uh, tooth margins. <laughs> Pretty notable there. Oh, you got a species of bully too. How about that? Nice uh, mycorrhizal mushroom right there, probably associating with the uh, the oaks. I don't think uh, I don't think the maples there uh, have any mycorrhizal affiliates. And uh, just growing along, growing prostrate along the ground here, you got the Michello repens. Nice uh, member of the uh, the Rubiaceae, the coffee family. This red berry on there. And then even cooler, you got another plant that parasitizes fungi in the Bramaniaceae. This is a uh, Apteria aphila. Just tiny, leafless. Okay, easy to miss, easy to step over without noticing. But notice it's got no uh, no green in it whatsoever. It's Achlorophilus. And there's the flower. Just parasitizing uh, mycorrhizal fungi, and the fungi in turn is uh, symbiotic with the surrounding trees. The stems on it, beautiful purple stems. And they just pop up sporadically all over this uh, little woodland. Where's the, uh, I wonder where the uh, Crotalus horridus is, the timber rattlesnake. He could be standing right on top of one and never see him. You know, and since <laughs> since so many fucking morons just kill him on sight now, you know, they've uh, evolved to stop rattling. To, so they're more, more dangerous now. They used to do you the courtesy of letting you know they were there. Not so much anymore, okay? We can't have nice things because people are morons. Loss of privileges. Anyway, there's that Ecteria aphila. Okay, you live in the southeast, you got a notice guy. Beautiful bastard. Okay, I just had to go ahead and do it. I ripped one of those flowers off, split it open. You can see the the uh, anthers are fused to that uh, corolla right there, that perianth. Nice uh, floral appendage. It's got some fringe on there, too. And then uh, there's that ovary style and stigma, the yellow stigma up top of that uh, anterior. I should mention, too, this is, a, this is an indicator plant. Uh, for a specific type of habitat, this kind of you know lowland, this you know perpetually wet lowland that's uh, uh, gradually it's got gradually uh, got water uh, moving through it. Perfect uh, timber rattlesnake habitat too. But you get your uh, your bay magnolias and American holly, etc. And there, there again, of course, is that Apteria, Apteria aphila, just uh, driving along. Uh, Traveling along the ground, kind of, kind of inconspicuous unless you're looking. Interesting to note over there uh, is different from over here. You can see down it's a little bit lower, a little wetter. You got your uh, tupelo, uh, your magnolia, you got your American holly, and uh, you got your uh, Acer rubrum, your uh, red maple. And then over here, you of course you go back to more of the uh, open uh, longleaf pine forest. Look at this guy up in a tree. Can you see that guy up there? Oh yeah. These fucking massive orbs, orb weavers are everywhere. Okay, and continuing slightly ascending, you know, only probably six feet higher than where we just were. Now we're in a nice open bog. You got your uh, Saracenia, your Saracenia back, the canopy of uh, longleaf pine. And of course, you get your sphagnum down at the bottom there. Very healthy uh, ecosystem right here. This is nice. Favorite uh, favorite genus in the carrot family, Apiaceae. Next to a Cymopteris. This is a Ringium. And this is a Ringium integrifolium. Look at those uh, flower heads. Bunch of tiny flowers uh, aggregated into a very dense umbel. 
Look at, and then of course you got those showy bracks, showy spiky bracks at the base. Regium's a huge genus, uh, occurs in uh, quite a few places uh, all over the world, including Brazil. Where you got again that uh, that eight foot wide, massive, massive bastard. This one, uh, this one's rather dainty. You can see if you can see his basal leaves down there. Nah. Anyway, there you go. Eryngium integrifolium. Then over here we got a species of Rexia. Melastomataceae is the family, but mostly tropical family. You get a lot of trees in that family as well. With a very uh, distinct uh, venation on their leaves. Look at the anthers on this guy. Holy shit. Curved upwards like uh, little bananas. You get uh, four petals. You got hairs on that calyx. Look, uh, very stiff hairs. Uh, perhaps urticating. The leaves look like just opposite leaves, linear. And then here we got a lovely composite, a lovely bog composite, Rebecca scabrifolia. You can see it's uh, we're way past flowering here. Scabrifolia because it's got the uh, sandpaper like a uh, texture to those leaves. Now down there you can see those uh, massive uh, paddle shaped basal leaves. What are you doing, Jack? Where are you going? Grass almost looks like uh, almost looks like Bermuda Bermuda grass at first glance, but it's uh, it's actually a native. I think it can get pretty tall, but it kind of forms these these thickets you got to walk through. Dicanthelium is the genus on this guy. Okay, back in the uh, the uh, sandy acidic uplands, right here we got a nice uh, helianthus species. Look at those phyleries right there, quite diagnostic. Okay. Good old Helianthus phyleries. Okay, not all of them look like that, of course, but uh, you can see they're multi seriate They're kind of spiky. Okay, very pointed. <clears throat> Got a scabbard texture to those leaves. Okay, uh, leaves closer to the uh, to the bottom of the plant, towards the base, are uh, opposite. And then as you go uh, further up the shoot, they become alternate. Looks like you got the little uh, either, uh, stipules or uh, uh, secondary uh, leaf buds. Right there, and then of course there's that. Uh, so let's get a nicer one, one that hasn't been all gnawed up. See little styles poking out there. And here we go. There's a uh, Euphorbia corallata. Remember those uh, those white bracts are not true petals. That uh, what you what looks like a single flower is actually a a compound flower called a cyathium. You can see that the green ovary in the center right there. The top by a stigma and then surrounded by uh, male flowers. Over here we got a milkweed, Asclepius abulveda. Okay, check out the uh, opposite leaves right there. Undulating margins, kind of wavering. Ooh, looks like you got an aborted follicle right there, an aborted fruit. Covered in pubescence, just growing on the sand. And of course, if you were to rip off... One of these leaves, you'd see that nice uh, bubbling up of uh, all the uh, toxic latex. Okay, unlike uh, this species over here, which doesn't have that toxic latex, and it's notable in the genus for being the, the one species that doesn't, is the Sclepius tuberosa, and it's still going off right now, despite the uh, you know, <laughs> despite it being the wrong time of year. These tend to bloom a lot, uh, a lot earlier. You know, of course now it's late, uh, late summer, early fall. You got a guy on there. Showy foliage, though. Showy-ass foliage. Those bright orange uh, coronas. Or we're using a whole different terminology here. And of course, yeah, you rip off one of them leaves, and uh, it doesn't bleed. There's none of that uh, toxic latex bubbling up. Look at the uh, heavy pubescence on that, uh, that stem. So hairy. Of course, there's the uh, flowers. Holy shit! What a what a nice humble. Over here, you got a nice uh, another composite species of uh, Berlandiera, which is in the Silphium tribe, the, the Silphium subtribe, the uh, Anglomaniaceae. Look at that! Pay attention to those phyleries, Silphium phyleries. All right, you can you can still see them. 
because the uh, the yellow ligules are so thin, you can still see those phyllaries in the background. Okay, which seems to be a, a common trait in all the Berlandiera species. Okay, look at those orange styles, just looking like little hairs. Okay, only the uh, only the outer florets are uh, fertile. They're the only place you're going to find seed. The inner disc florets are uh, functionally staminate. So you know when, when this flower head matures, you're only going to find seed on those uh, on the outside of that flower head. Okay, and then uh, moving on up, uh, you can see we're on a sandstone glade right here. There's very little topsoil. The yellow flower is Bigalovia in the uh, Asteraceae, of course. Disc flowers, discoid flowers, no ligules, and, uh, you know, pretty uh, <laughs> pretty meh foliage, just a linear foliage. But it's, you can see it's thriving here in, uh, in late summer, early fall. You can see it's, just, it's all over that little meadow, too. The pines are loblolly pine and uh, pinus palustris longleaf pine. And uh, normally this is running. Though this should be this is running if you know you had had some rain, but uh, it's been pretty dry. Also flowering diminutive little bastards. It's a uh, diminutive little bastards week, at least in East Texas on the sandstone glades. Not those squirtum bivalve, okay. The onion subfamily of the Amaryllis family, Amaryllis Daceae. See that the central ovary in the middle, middle there, stop out of, top out of style, and you got the uh, st the stamens with their yellow anthers just surrounding it. Of course, you got a little bulb down there in the ground. The, since they're uh, algal associate, they can photosynthesize without getting shaded out by any of uh, the taller growing stuff, any of the taller grasses or anything on this uh, sandstone glade. You got the species of lichen. Yeah, you got you got quite a few species of lichen. It looks like. And of course, it being uh, early fall, the liatris is going strong still. Look at those uh, phyllaries. Okay, not recurved, not too pointed. Phyllaries are diagnostic on this uh, genus because, you know, other than elegans, I mean, other than elegans and cymosa, a lot of the species in this genus just tend to all look the same. Oh, yeah, so this being a dry, rocky, acidic site in the uh, central United States, of course, we're going to bump into this guy, uh, which uh, is actually quite rare. It's in the bitterroot family, Montiaceae. This is Femoranthus parviflorus. You can see succulent succulent uh, foliage and uh, you know if you see them and they're flushed red you'll notice that those red pigments are betalane pigments uh, you know the betalanes have a very distinct and notable uh, pigmentation to them when they're uh, flushed in red you know that's, that's what cacti have that's what beets have and of course uh, only plants in the order caryophyllales have betalane pigments look at that uh, look at that central ovary green ovary Green ovary surrounded by, uh, looks like eight stamens with yellow anthers and uh, five pink petals. They're just this kind of finger-like succulent foliage. They can get a lot taller than this. They can get about, you know, eight inches, uh, about eight, eight, yay tall, about yay tall. Got another one over there. Here's some that are just in the, oh, there's another one right there. Here's some that are just in the vegetative stage. You can see. You know, if I saw this and didn't know what it was, I'd, I'd know immediately it was in Caryophyllales. You got those betalanes. Just uh, thriving in the uh, rocky outcrops. See, there, there's another guy. He's just opening. They, they open later in the day. They're not open in the morning. They need some heat. Well, I'm pretty thoroughly toasted now, so uh, I think I'll end it there. That's a nice spot. I like to end it with a member of the Montiaceae. And the rocky, <laughs> the, the Zeric rocky uh, sandstone glade. Sandstone and limestone. At a Catahoula formation. Well, that's all I got for today. Uh, hope you had a nice time. Uh, don't be a prick. Uh, go fuck yourself. Bye. Ah, uh, look at this milkweed.
Asclepius viridis. Just the oleander aphids just going to town on the stem in the background there. See that? I got a nice milkweed bug back there too. Look at that. See the stigmatic slits in between those uh, those green horns? The hoods are all reflexed, pulled back. Fucking weird. <laughs> this is a weird, uh, some weird morphology on this one. And uh, unlike most other Asclepius, this one doesn't have opposite leaves. They're whirled around the stem. And the stem's kind of flattened. You can see that. Flat, it's laterally flattened on one side. Or I guess two out of four sides. Stunner right there. Glabrous leaves, no hairs. Prominent uh, mid vein. Just a nice uh, coalescent milkweed up there. How many plants in Texas cling to a precarious existence just existing on the uh, margins of roadsides, you know? Just the uh, subject at all times to the frivolous whims of uh, of road grading. Needless road grading. Anyway, here's uh, Gallardia estivalis, variety Winkleri. Of course, uh, the species, just Gallardia estivalis, the regular variety, is uh, orangish red, uh, Corolla lobes. You can see those... Uh, Corollas right there, those ligules. This one has pink, and it's got the darker disc florets too. Got a purple disc florets. You can see the styles poking out right there. There's there's the filaries. There's the leaves. A couple months ago, there were you know dozens of them right here. I mean, probably a couple hundred, but uh, they're all gone. Hope they'll come back. Hopefully, the seed's still there, but. Uh, Kind of waste, wasteful anyway. Though. The road didn't need to be graded. Same situation with that Asclepius prostrata over in uh, South Texas. There's some nice trash right there, too. Here you go. Here's another uh, odd variety of an otherwise common plant. This is Liatris elegans variety brigisiae. You, know, you can see they got the yellow phyleries. Still flowering. They flower from the top down. So these are these are older uh, capitula up here, and then uh, still flowering ones down towards the bottom. And of course, once they flower, they kind of age to a white. Just arched over again. There's a flower head on it. The Gallardia. There's that uh, Erythrina herbacea, the coral bean. All right. Here we go, Eupatorium uh, capillifolium. Still one of the weirdest eupes I've seen yet, okay? The flowers are pendant. Here's one flowering. A lot aren't even flowering yet. A lot of them aren't even uh, going off yet. You can see right there. Almost looks like a, some sort of weedy asparagus or something. That linear foliage. Hair-like foliage. But uh, you can clearly see when you get up close those uh, Eupatoria-ish flowers. The long style branches coming out. What a weird... Man, composites are so variable and, and weird. It's just really... What the fuck? And this this species is common as hell in East Texas. Very common here. You see it coming up in gas station... I was taking a piss yesterday outside the gas station parking lot. I prefer to piss outside. I don't want to go in that nasty-ass bathroom. And so... uh And this was just coming up everywhere. Again, Eupatorium capillifolium. Who doesn't love a youp? I've got a nice ambrosia here too. Look at that. 